the, the second unit effects guy on Real Genius uh, was was the 300 pound effects man. He had a habit of running everywhere, whether you really needed to run on that particular moment or not. He did everything in lickety split in a big giant hurry with gaffer's tape and um, big giant pairs of pliers and vice grips and stuff. His whole tool bag was full of vice grips and channel locks and dikes and, and big rolls of, of bailing wire and rolls of tape and stuff. And it was down and dirty special effects. And we started um, a bunch of us. We kind of came to be known as Jerry's kids because we were running with Jerry on second unit. But uh, we made sure that we always had a little bit of buckshot in our pockets. And any time that we saw Jerry's bag laying around, we would sprinkle a little bit of shot into it and give it a kick so it would kind of settle in. And I actually saw him one time, kind of toward the end, end of the show, running up the companionway to get into the belly of the B-1. He said, like, God, this bag is getting heavy. And the strap was actually starting to fray. And I was waiting for that magic moment when and then all this shot would spill out all over the stage, but I never actually saw that happen. We had to uh, work with popcorn in that movie on a very, very large scale. And uh, you kind of, you get involved with something like that, you start learning stuff right away. Popcorn is real, real flammable. We didn't know that, but think about it. What is it? It's fuel and air, beautifully blended together, waiting only for a spark to set it off. So, first of all, we had to invent a way to pop tons of popcorn. You can't buy large quantities, truckloads of corn that's already popped because of that fire hazard issue. It's not a safe thing to transport in large amounts. So we had to pop it ourselves. So we bought a hot air popper and we took it apart to see how it works. Pretty simple. You've got a source of heat with a fan below it and a screen. The corn kernels go in at the top, they get heated from below and as soon as they pop the draft of air lifts them up out of, the, out of the chamber. So we built a dozen hot air poppers that were three feet in diameter and eight feet tall. Then we had to figure out a way to feed large quantities of popcorn kernels up to the top of this machine so that they would produce on an ongoing basis. So I did a little bit of research and found out how they pump the food into uh, chicken coops in uh, egg factories. You know, there's a tube plastic tube with a long continuous spring inside of it and the food is fed into the bottom and the spring is spun and so the kernels come out the top and fall into the machine. Well this also turned out to be the way to get the popcorn into the giant doughboy swimming pool that's inside the dining room of this Victorian house it was with a three foot diameter screw auger which we obtained and connected onto a Chevy small block V8 engine which immediately stalled the moment the hopper was filled with popcorn. So another Chevy was brought in and a chain going across with a pair of shafts. Turned them on, turned on both of the motors, stalled. The corn was compacting around the edges of the screw auger and it wasn't moving. So finally with a third Chevy engine and bigger shafts and bigger bearings and bigger sprockets, they could actually get the popcorn to lift up through this thing and poof out the top. But it had been sprayed with a uh, borate solution to make it fireproof. So the people that were eating the popcorn on set uh, discovered it kind of started tasting funny. So it was one guy's job to stand there by the conveyor belt as the popcorn came by with a Hudson sprayer just spritzing all of it so that it wouldn't catch on fire. And we all got to really hate the smell of popcorn by the time that show was over. But it's a lot of fun to watch. Miniatures are still used, but they're used on a, on a very different sort of way. They're used at very large scales and uh, a lot of times it's uh, a situation where you have pyro or, or breakaways or collapsing or something on a, on a pretty grand scale where before it was like a little vehicle that was on a motion control rig that you could take your time with and really jewel out and get it perfect and then put it up there and have it move in a very careful studied sort of manner over and over again. Now that I'm retired, um, a, a lot of what I learned and a lot of the, uh, the strange combinations of materials have in fact spilled over into my artwork. Part of the time I like messing around with clay. I have always loved doing that. But the other part of the time when I'm making things, I like to do assemblages. I like to take found objects of different strange sorts and put them together in a new kind of context and then find a way of blending all these things in, whether I'm using epoxy or molten wax or, or, or 
thin uh, dissolved paint to age something down. I find that I'm drawing upon a lot of the things that I learned way back then, and they've become amalgamated back there as a kind of a big bin of resources. And I'm really thankful for the opportunities that I had in my movie career to learn all this stuff, to have fun learning it, and to still have enough brain cells left after breathing all this exotic crap to be able to put it to good use now. The only thing about it that I don't have is those big fat paychecks, but c'est la vie. <laughs>